Aha! It actually looks like I'm live now. Cool. Let me just tweet it out real quick. Awesome. So um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat while I'm working. Uh, I'll try to explain sort of what I'm doing as I'm doing it a little bit. And um, yeah, if anything's up, like if you can't hear me or something's wrong, just let me know. I'll try to fix it. I've never really streamed before, so kind of do the whole thing. But um, yeah, I'm sure we'll figure it out. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to make one live first, and then I have a couple of examples that I already did before. Um, I was sort of fooling around with it a little bit which I'll open up as well. And then, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll sort of explain how I did those and what my process is. So for the people that don't really know what the challenge is, the whole point is to start um, that, uh, well, to start from just a sphere and that's it and sort of go from there. Now, some people mentioned like uh, that I would be a good person to do it because I work a lot with modifiers. So let's get started actually. Um, let's see, I won't enable screencasting keys just yet, um, but if if you guys would like that, just let me know and I'll enable them. But I'll be explaining anyway, so. All right, so I use this round cube thing a lot because it's got nice geometry. So let's get started. So the first thing I like to do uh, is sort of mess around with layers and see what I can do with those. So um, I use this sol solidify thing quite a bit. And uh, adding some thickness to this basically means that you've got a mesh inside a mesh, which is really nice because um, if I'm going to start cutting pieces out, then we get this really cool layered effect. Uh, you can get some really interesting results with it. So generally, I'll just add a second layer of solidify just on top of that. There we go. And now we've got something cool we can get started with. So let's see. Let's subdivide the sucker and see what we can do with it. Adding some displays here, just checking it out. And I really like this distorted noise because you can get some super interesting results with it. Maybe make it a little bit bigger. All right, so because we've got this layered thing going um, and the, what do we call it? The uh, texture coordinates are set to local. This is actually affecting each layer separately in a different way, which is really nice. So I'm going to smooth this out. And hello to everybody, obviously. <laughs> Let's get this layered thing going. Now, um, in my previous video, I used this vertex weight edit. And I use it quite a lot lately because it allows you to get some really cool effects very, very quickly. And uh, let me just type in a name here. Let's call it destroy. Let's set this thing up. I've done this so many times at this point. Still not right, is it? and throw on a mask here. So this is something I, I do a lot. Uh, here we go. Add in the vertex group and something's up. There we go. So I get this really cool broken up effect and you can do some very, very stuff. Ah, some very cool stuff. And um, what I like about this is that even if you have a bunch of modifiers on it towards the end, uh, as you'll see, you can keep layering and layering, layering. Um, the UI theme I'm using is called Amaranth. If you look in the description, there should be a download link actually. Uh, it was originally created uh, by 
Pablo Vasquez, I believe. Um, and then I, I created some colored versions of it. Um, do I have any idea what I'm going to do? Not really. I mean, I've done three of them now, so I'm, I'm going to use some of the same tricks I did before. But whenever I work, generally, I just try to, I don't know, I just see what comes out. Um, I found that if I go in with sort of a preconceived notion of, of what I want to do, I get frustrated if it doesn't work or it doesn't like, you know, um, turn out to be what I had in my head. So that's why I go into it sort of empty headed and see, see what happens. And the fun thing about these modifiers is you're able to iterate super quick so you can try all kinds of crazy stuff. So I'm going to smooth this out a little bit. So now, as you can see, we get these really interesting lines, which almost looks like something like a fluid sim. Now, um, what I'll do to create some more geometry here as well uh, is add a solidify. And this just makes it like a full crazy, <laughs> crazy uh, mesh, I guess. The displacement texture is, let's see, uh, it's a distorted noise um, with just the, the noise distortion set to Voronoi and the bass is set to Blender Original. Now the whole stream will be archived as well, so I'll leave it up on the YouTube channel. So if you're joining later or whatever, um, you can always watch it or rewatch it. But I'm just setting up some basic parameters so I can start messing with them. Um, so I like the idea here, but I already did one that was quite similar to it. So I'm just gonna mess around with the texture. This is exactly what I was talking about. Because you've set it up, you can go really, really fast and just check stuff out. Eh, I don't know, I'm not 100% convinced. Let's see what else we have here. What happens if I split these up? smooth Ooh, I like that it's all messed up maybe a little too much though we want to keep some of the mesh to keep it interesting I'm going a little too too hard on some of this stuff, so I'm going to throw some of these out, throw the edge split out, um, maybe turn off the mask and the vertex weight, see what happens. So another modifier I like quite a lot actually is the decimate modifier. And go back, change this to something a little bit more normal. place quite a bit and when you get something like this um, what happens with the solidify so if I just turn on the mask again real quick generally what happens with the solidify is get these flipped normals on the inside I actually found a really cool trick that if you add a normal edit behind those where are we solidifies and which one was it I got it to work the other day. And of course, as I'm trying this, it's gonna go horribly wrong. Let's see. Why aren't you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Oh yeah, of course it says enable auto smooth, so. Once you enable that, you can see it flips the normals and it sort of puts them all in the same direction. So now you've got a, uh, an object that is pointing, like has all the normals pointing the right way. So you can do some cool stuff and you get behavior that's a little bit better. So if I turn off the vertex weight and the mask again, what you see if I turn the displace back on, 
Um, we don't get any flipped normals and all the stuff is sort of going the same direction, which is really nice. Let's see. We will add in something like a simple deform. Twist this. Or if we copy this and add maybe like a taper. That's a bit much. I believe I'm able to, I'm allowed to scale the sphere as far as I know. Am I? I don't know actually. You know what? I'll just scale it like this. Where are we? No, scale it up just a little bit. Actually, it has to be a sphere, doesn't it? I'm not sure. I don't want to break the rules. Make this a little bit bigger. It's starting to look fairly interesting. So as I was saying before with the decimate modifier, um, what I really like about it is you can either collapse stuff down, if it's on, where are we? At the bottom here. Uh, and you get sort of interesting looking triangles and stuff, but you can do some really cool other things with it. And I'm actually gonna turn on the wire here for a second so we can just preview it on the mesh. Um, rather than just using the regular collapse. Uh, I like using the unsubdivide sometimes because it gives you sort of a cross mesh. So I'm just gonna show you very quickly what happens if I do that with a plane. So if I subdivide it a couple of times like this, then if I turn on draw all edges here. If I were to decimate it, <clears throat> and go to unsubdivide, you can actually get sort of these crossed uh, looking polygon lines, which is really interesting. It is a round cube, yeah. Um, I have, what is it in my add-ons here? I believe it's extra objects, add mesh extra objects enabled. And if you hit shift A, that actually allows you to just put in a round cube, so. Yeah, I know it is scaling, I guess. Um, I'll hold hold off on it unless I really really need it. So for now, I'm just gonna just gonna let it be its own thing, and we'll see what happens. So the unsubdivide does some cool stuff. The planar one is definitely my favorite because, as you can see, you get these really weird, odd-looking things. And basically, what it's looking at is um, if you have like two polygons or a bunch of polygons that are at an angle from each other, it's gonna try and flatten them out, smooth them out. So if I set this to, like 15 degrees all of a sudden we get this really crazy structure. Now, what can this be cool for is if we combine it with other stuff. So remember, we also have the inside here. And actually, if I'm gonna chip away at this a little bit, now we get this mesh that looks really sort of bad and broken on the outside. But whenever I'm doing this kind of stuff, I'm not really looking at my topology. I'm more sort of looking at, at it for the effects that I can do with it. For example, if I were to add a wireframe on top of this, all of a sudden we get this really interesting looking weird thing. Now, obviously if we turn off replace original, then we can see the wireframe on top. If I mess with the thickness here, then we get this really, really weird geometry and we can go even further and try some really crazy things with it. Now setting the boundary, will make sure that any edges of the mesh where it's broken up uh, will be closed. And uh, what I really like doing then is adding a subdivision surface modifier on top of it. So I'm gonna turn my wire off again. And now, as you can see, we're starting to get some really interesting looking things. Um, this is great for like organic looking stuff and, and making it look kind of nasty. Uh, and let's add in another level. It gets a little bit slower, but uh, that doesn't really bother me. Um, as long as it works and it looks good, I don't mind. But you can also already imagine like if you start to put lights in this and um, do some just like crazy, crazy lighting and some interesting shading, you can get some very, very weird looking results very quickly. Now, um, I also like playing with this relative thickness because then any of the wires that are longer are actually gonna be thicker than the short ones. And it gives you even more sort of this viney organic look and you can go even further with it um, and just push it really far. Now something else that a lot of people uh, sort of forget about the wireframe I've noticed, they can offset this stuff. 
So by offsetting it, now we have our original mesh and we have the wireframe being pushed out. And as you can see, um, now it gets insanely complex and it looks like one of those things that you'd have to like model at really like a lot and make it, I don't know, like really work at it to get it like this. And we've been streaming for like, what well, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, and I'm already at this point. So this is actually one of the main reasons I do a lot of this stuff um, with modifiers, not only because it's not that I don't like modeling, I'm just not very fast at it. So I get frustrated very quickly and I can't really get my ideas out. Um, so this is my way around that so I can get into shading a lot more quicker and really mess with it. And as you'll see, um, when I'm working, generally I'll start doing shading and lighting very, fairly quickly, uh, sort of render it out a little bit, maybe even comp it a little bit and then change it and render it out. And that way um, you've got this great interaction going back and forth between your final image and your, uh, I guess, and your work, sort of your 3D view and what you're trying to do. Now it's cool, but I'm not 100% convinced. So I'm just gonna turn off these solidify layers and sort of check out what we're left with right now. I wanna tweak this a little bit more cause I'm still not convinced this displace texture is the best thing it can be. Um, so let's see what else we have in here. Turn this down a little bit. As you can see, I'm just trying stuff. Like there's no real trick to it. There's just um, me trying to think of things that might be interesting and that I can do. Um, let's see, uh, maybe add in at least one layer. It's interesting, but I'm not really feeling it. What else do we have that we might be able to use? If we cast this way at the beginning. And like when you're adding modifiers um, that you're sort of adding in later that you want higher up the stack, it's really interesting to see what happens when you move them up because sometimes you hit like an idea or whatever that's all of a sudden really, really cool and interesting. So let's see if we cast this into a cylinder, what that does, we'll bring these down for a sec and turn all of these off. There you go. All right. And another subsurf, bring this up. This is a very boring process, but it's a price I'm willing to pay. So the reason I'm adding this in is because now we can get more control over the uh, the cast here. So you mess with the factor. There we go. We don't even have to <laughs> use Warren. <laughs> I'll have a look at it in a bit. Um, <laughs> but this is sort of cheating because now we can use a completely different base shape um, in one of the, uh, which I'm call it one of the examples I'll show you a little bit later. Um, I'll show you that I end up with a cube and it's exactly the way I did it here. Subsurf it, cast it, and then you get some uh, very interesting topology. Now this is horrible topology because like we have one really big, if I turn on the wire again, one really big thing up here and then uh, lots of topology down here. But again, uh, because we're working with modifiers, we can fix that very quickly. And because I do a lot of procedural shading, I'm not worried about UVs and other things, and I don't really care, honestly. Uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with procedural textures. We can remesh it. And where most people would be like, oh, this mesh is all broken and it's messed up. I kind of like that when, um, you know, I'm not necessarily gonna use it right now, but I like it when meshes go a little weird and, and deform and aren't quite perfect because it generally gives you more intricate, intricate and interesting results, I find anyway. And it just fits my sort of weird style. Here, look at that. Like, what the hell is all this crap? What happens if we turn a bunch of these modifiers back on? Um, be pretty interesting. So let's see. Mess with the sharpness a little bit. And let's start turning some of these back on. That looks terrible, but I'm not too bothered. I'm not going to turn on the subsurf because that's going to mess everything up. That's absolutely crazy. I'm gonna turn these wires back off and see what we're working with exactly. So it might be interesting now to smooth it out a little bit. 
some more in the beginning. So I'm, as you can see, I'm constantly going back and forth, turning modifiers on and off. And um, I found that when I do this kind of thing, I have sort of a lot of the same tricks that I use over and over again. But because I have them here, I can just move them around the stack, turn them on and off, and sort of hope that everything doesn't crash. So let me actually save a file first. Always important. Let's save the Blender file. And what was I doing? I was going to add a smooth. So maybe smooth that weird thing out a little bit. Smooth, smooth. Yeah, bring it up. I mean, as you can see, I'm working with quite a lot of these modifiers, and Blender is still able to handle it really well. So, something I like about it a little lot, quite a lot. Not 250, but 25. I don't really know where this is going. This is almost more interesting. Let's see what else we can turn off. Like the smooth here. Whew, the remesh goes completely crazy. Smooth the remesh out a little bit. That looks cool. It's sort of like, I don't know, some kind of space station or something. And that's, you know, that's that's what it's about. <laughs> spore, yeah, geez, that's quite quite a long time ago. It's it's the spore, the video game you're talking about, right? That came out quite a number of years ago. I think it's like ten years at this point. But anyway, um, I digress. Now we get stuff that looks interesting. Also, um, I might have been decimating this before, but this is a really cool pattern to do stuff with. So let's see what happens when we solidify this. So I have my solidifies over here, and it looks like I might have thrown one out. So I'm pretty sure I don't want to use these two anymore at this point. I can always go back. Um, simple deform. Don't want to twist it. Nope. Is there an edge split in here? But I threw that out, I guess. What happens if I do decimate it? <laughs> I know it's called the simplicity challenge. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I've got mixed feelings as well about the way I do things, but the whole point is that it's like a sphere. <laughs> Can I add a sphere and link the modifier stack? Yeah, sure, I'll try it out. See what happens. It's the regular one. I think it'll be quite similar because I'm already like subdividing up here and stuff, but it's just a regular UV sphere. Scale up to the same size and we'll link them real quick. Modifiers. That's interesting. Ah, I need to enable auto smooth option here. And is modifier requires more than three input faces. So what's going on then? I turn off the round cube real quick. Turn off the decimate on the sphere. Let's see if we turn stuff off. Or is it going wrong? Oh, of course, it doesn't have the vertex group, so I'd have to add in the vertex group as well. Um. <laughs> Jellyfish, that's nice. Hey, even if you know, even if it doesn't apply to the challenge, the whole point is that you did something with it. You know what I mean? Um, it's, that's sort of that's why I like uh, challenges like this, and I think Grant was spot on um, with what he's trying to do here. It's a uh, yeah, it's just cool because it, it gives you food for thought. Like, even though I work with a lot of modifiers, I generally um, like duplicate objects very quickly and then like invert vertex groups to make them fit together and do stuff. And I have to rethink a lot of stuff uh, to make it work in just one object. So I believe it was called destroy. There we go. And then if we turn on the mask. So yeah, I would say it looks pretty similar. A um, little less messy, I guess. So let me just move it over here. 
So that would be the round cube and that would be the sphere. I think they have the same, I just don't have the decimate on it. There you go. So pretty similar, I guess. Restrictions breed creativity. Yeah, that's very true. Um, it's something that I found when I started learning Blender because uh, I used to work with 3ds Max and um, when I started moving over to Blender, I didn't know all of the tools and I sort of had to reinvent myself and figure out some of the stuff that I did before, um, like see how it works in Blender. And from that, I got a lot of great new ideas as well, which is really cool. So I'm gonna hide the sphere for now. I don't know what happened with these layers down here, but we keep on going to the round cube because I like it. I also did like what happened when I turned the decimate off. So maybe if I change it to collapse and the ratio up a little bit, what happens if I use that destroy and I flip it around? So now we're getting an interesting um, mix of two different sort of topologies. I don't know if I, how well you can see it. So on the one hand, we've got this really broken mess that we can do some crazy things with. And on the other hand, we've got this really clean grid pattern. So now we can start tweaking it and, and really going for it and trying stuff. So let me turn off this first solidify. No, maybe the second one. Yeah, I kind of like it, big mess that it is. Whew, look at that. Okay, so what is this? At this point, I'm trying to figure out like, does it, is it something, could it be something cool or is it just like, am I going too far with it? So again, let's go back and see if we have to turn stuff off. Eh, not really. Try to subsurf, be very patient. Eh. I think I'm trying a little too hard. I wonder if we can subdivide this. And subdivide it again. <laughs> this could become a cool dystopian cooling tower, you're right. Um, I found that a lot of the, the assets that I create, like with a little bit of extra love, they could probably end up in a, in a sci-fi movie somewhere. Um, but I think I'm gonna bring down the remesh a little bit. There we go. So again, this is where I start thinking in terms of this wireframe. Um, I want less, you know, I want there to be just enough information to do something interesting with, but not too much that it's like overcrowded and doing weird things. So. Uh, we're gonna, somebody mentioned Voronoi, so let's have a look. Let's see what happens when we go over to Voronoi. I'll save at this point so I can go back easily. So the thing with Voronoi is I tend to flip it quite a bit because I find it to be a more interesting pattern. Let's see if we start breaking away at this mesh. And a lot of it is about like just letting go and not freaking out about I have something cool and I don't want to destroy it. Like if you keep working at it, generally you'll find an even better result. So the next thing I want to do is this wireframe is too much. It's just a little bit too much for me. And I want to, um, I still want the, the wires to be in it, but I want them to do different things. Uh, I don't want them to be as overpowering. So we can do exactly the same thing as we did before with the vertex weight edit. But um, I can just add in a second vertex group, call that wire, and then use exactly the same trick for just the wireframe. So let's put in wire and flip all this stuff around. So if you're wondering where this is coming from, if you haven't seen my previous tutorial, just look at it. Um, it explains it in greater detail. So this is a texture of the wire. 12 million faces, good lord. Yeah, you can go pretty high when you're using modifiers, that's right. I found that it generally goes 
pretty quick until you hit about, at least on my machine, when I hit about two to three million polys, then it generally starts slowing down. The decimate, especially the planar decimate, is a really, yeah, I love it. I love the effect that it gives, but um, it gets really, really slow, unfortunately. So I think it's calculating a lot of stuff in the background. Um, anyway, we have this texture and we'll assign the wire vertex group here. And there we go. Let's have a look. Wire. And maybe use something else for this one. Clouds. And now we can interactively sort of see the wire come in. And now it's still there, but it's not quite, you know, as um, overpowering. You can still see the rest of the, uh, of the mesh. I'm still not 100% happy with the topology of the mesh, though. I want something a little bit more refined. Um, so let's see. Let's save real quick and hit planner here. It's just giving me weird stuff. I think our cast might be uh, the issue. Could use it, but maybe bring down the factor a little bit just to shape it. Bring the level down here. Oh yeah, and that's another effect, by the way, that I love with the wireframe. So let me show you that real quick as well. Let's just subdivide this a little bit. Uh, put it here. Let's add in a wireframe very quickly and subdivide that out. And you get these really cool looking, I don't know, it's sort of like almost a fishnet sort of pattern or something. Um, you can get really crazy with it. I love that kind of stuff. So I don't know if it fits this in particular, but I don't know. I'm still not really feeling the cast throughout the displays, didn't I? I think it might be time to bring it back. But I'm going to turn off the subsurf and move this up. By the way, if anybody knows of a really good trick to move it up further in one click, I'm all ears. I don't actually know uh, if there is one. So we're going to put this after the solidify. Bring back the displace texture. Let's see if we set this to five. I want it to be only pushing out. And that's what I'm talking about. This is starting to look a lot more interesting already. I like it when you end up with these sort of cavernous insides and although this looks like really extreme um, I think the main so sort of the main look has been achieved and now it's all about refining it and trying to wrangle it into a shape that we can use so first order of business is another smooth modifier and see if we hit it hard what happens there we go it looks almost like nebulous smooth this out Turn on the smooth shading over here. And I think, let's have a look at the solidify. If we can tweak that a little bit. Push some of this stuff out. It might be the second one that's uh, giving us some hassle. We're getting there, but it's not quite there yet. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to switch up the Voronoi. <laughs> yeah, you can do crazy stuff with modifiers. It gets, uh, gets super interesting. But slow as well, as you can see, especially when you're trying to adjust this. It can be, can be a little annoying. So again, that's down to the subsurf here at the bottom. So I'm just going to turn that off real quick. Hmm. I like the way this sort of spills out and sort of like looks like it's connected to it somehow. But I think it's time to push it a little bit further. It's going to turn off the wireframe for a second. Uh, and just look at where the shape is coming from. 
Do I need to remesh it, yes or no? I think we can turn that one off and just subsurf it a little bit more here in the beginning. So I think I've got a little too far. I need to go back and fix my like base shape first to make sure it's working. All right, and turn some of this stuff off. Where are we? So we've got the solidify and the displace. Okay. I want the displace to be a little bit more violent, I guess. I keep going back to the distort noise a lot because I, I just really like it. What the heck is going on here? Something's up with this. What happens if we just put it, we mesh it all into blocks? Yeah, but AD already did that, so I don't want to copy him. He did something really cool. I don't know if you saw it on Twitter, made like these fake, uh, sort of these building looking things. It looked awesome. Let's play with these directions. That's kind of cool. Pretty dynamic. Let's mess with these. Ooh, I like that. So now this kind of stuff really lends itself to remeshing a lot. Let's do this. Do I need that second solidify layer? Do I need the first one? Maybe. What happens if we move this vertex weight edit and this mask up a little bit? Let's have a look here. That's the displace, it's the weight. Now that I like. That looks interesting. That's right, 80 did adjust the sphere size. I remember. You're right. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. I know I've said this a couple of times at this point, so if you're not taking me seriously anymore, I totally get it. Let's mess with this exponent. So at the same time, I'm already looking for like a good composition to see if there's a nice angle that we could look at. I like that. I sort of like the dynamic of it being, uh, I don't know, like at a, at a sharp angle. It's cool. Okay. So now we've got this all crazy messed up mesh. Let's see if we can make something out of it. Is the decimate valuable at this point? No, it's not. Is the cast valuable at this point? I think not, because I definitely like this better. Let's see. Let's bring back, ooh. Might be a bit much. Um, something really cool about the smooth, by the way, if you set the factor to minus 0.5, it sort of exaggerates the mesh you already have, so that's cool. Now remember we have all these crazy uh, extra sort of vertex groups we can try and apply this to, but no, I don't think it's doing anything for us. The wireframe is going loopy though, so I'm gonna have to fix that. It's probably because of the offset. I have no idea what this is. Okay, I'm gonna hold off on this one for a second and start fresh. This is generally what I like to do when I hit a sort of a creative block. Start with a fresh palette um, or a fresh canvas and see if you can do something else. All right. Let's see. 
Looks like Fortress of Solitude. Yeah, it does a little, I guess. Um, unfortunately, I can't instance them. Otherwise, I'd do like a big landscape with them. and It'd be pretty cool. Well, actually, maybe now that you mention that, what does happen if we remesh this? So I turn off the wireframe here for a sec. That might actually help to bring it back to something a little more normal. Oh, this looks like a wood log or something. Some or some kind of Death Star, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. What happens now? That's interesting. Yeah. Remesh is pretty slow though. Well, I like that. Could we form that into something crystal-like? I wonder. Let's see if we can do that. Leave these on here. And smooth the ever-living crap out of it. Let's get rid of these nasty edges. That looks cool. There we go. It looks like I didn't even have to uh, have to throw it out to begin with. This is going to get slow real, real quick. Okay. Well, it's definitely something. What happens if I bring these down? Now this I could get into. So let's see. I think it's time to try some shading. I'll put in a camera first. Um, set this to, actually I'm gonna set it to 2048, 2048, render it 50%. Do the vertex trick on the smooth modifier. That might be a good idea. Let's see what happens. I don't know if this one will work because obviously the um, the vertices in that one are uh, already gone, so we might have to use the wire one. But then we'll have to turn it on. Let's see. Yeah, it does it give it an extra sort of layer of uh, of weirdness. And for everybody that has checked this channel out before, you know we're all about the weirdness. Okay. I think I'm gonna hold off for a second on modifiers. Let's get this camera working. So, um, this is another little trick. Uh, I believe, which I talked about, um, I think it was in the the Blender Motion Graphics course on the Blender Cloud. Um, so something I like to do uh, when it comes to to framing things and making stuff look cool and finding a good composition. Um, first of all, the default 35 millimeter focal length for camera is, if you're doing like these really weird microscopic things, generally you're not gonna use very wide lens. Um, you're gonna use something that's sort of more zoomed in that flattens out the image a little bit and it'll make it look smaller already. So generally I, I use something like a, a 70 mil millimeter and 85 millimeter lens. Um, I have a bit of a background in photography, so this stuff is a bit more natural. But as you can see, when you frame this, it becomes a lot more interesting because you can see the lines of it a lot better. Um, if you, let's see, if you go back, the camera, and like, let's really exaggerate this, for example, go to 24, then it's a lot harder to frame this thing because it gets super exaggerated. Although I'll admit that is pretty rad. Um, and let's have a look at the chat. Seem like modifiers are your second name. It's so easy for you to manipul manipulate them. Did you learn all of them alone uh, by experimenting in practice? Yeah, basically. Um, and hi to Grant Willock from Remington. Thanks for joining. Uh, awesome, awesome for you, all of you to drop by. Um, 
so the whole modifier th modifiers thing uh I do test it out a lot. Um, I sit here just noodling away and, and seeing what works and doesn't work. Um, the thing is, the way I started, the reason I started working like that is way in the beginning um, when I used 3ds Max um, a few years back. It has a really nice modifier stack as well, and that's actually one of the reasons why I really liked moving over to Blender because I did um, what do you call it? I, I used modifiers in Max as well, so. For me, that was already a very natural way of working. Um, if you want to see where I got a lot of inspiration and where I learned a lot from, um, there's a guy called Alan McKay. He's a vis visual effects artist. He does absolutely stellar work. Um, he actually sort of got me into modeling with modifiers in 3ds Max, and that translated over into Blender. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is just messing around and trying things. Now, with the camera, I want to make sure that we are Passport 2 over here is uh, at 100% because otherwise you're getting, you know, you can't get the full idea of what exactly it is you're doing. So let's see. I like this. I like the way this is structured. Uh, turn off lock camera to view. Um, I'm just going to duplicate this camera very quick so we can keep that view. The thing I was talking about before I started going off on a crazy tangent is I like to use the trackball method as well. I'm going to lock this back to the view and just switching over because it works differently. And as you can see, you can turn your camera in a different way very quickly and get all these super crazy dynamic um, views and you're not locked to, uh, to the two axes you're usually turning around. So if you look at something like that, that's really cool as well. We're getting pretty experimental here. Let's see what happens. Maybe frame it up a little bit more like that. All right, so I'm going to turn off lock camera to view, and now we actually have two cameras we can switch between. Um, I think I might like the second one here a little bit better. Doesn't feel quite as balanced though. Uh, let's move around a little bit. Maybe something like this. And hello to everybody joining as well. Thanks for joining the stream. So split this view and start doing some fun shading stuff. This is where all the magic happens, as they say. And it's gonna get really warm in here really quickly now because this computer is gonna start kicking out heat. I might open a window at some point. Um, if I do and the noise is too much, let me know so I can close it again. Uh... <laughs> No worries, Grant. Uh, if you're in the middle of a class, go do your thing. Uh, I'll archive the stream so you can watch it again later if you want to. Actually, I'm going to open the window real quick. Right. There's going to be a little bit of background noise. If, it, if it's really too much, let me know and I'll, I'll close it again. Okay, so let's start shading some stuff. Now, obviously, when we start rendering, uh, we're not gonna see much. Why is there two round cubes? Because um, I was gonna try something else and then all of a sudden we stumbled on something cool. So that second one is just actually, it's just a round cube at the moment. So let's do away with the confusion, just throw it out because we don't even need it. Solidify, I think if I try to solidify this mesh, um, everything's just gonna crash really hard. So I'm gonna hold off on that one for a sec. Um, so I use the Blender Cloud add-on. Um, so I can hit Control, Shift, Alt, A, and then it connects you, uh, once you've logged in through Blender, connects you to the texture and HDRI um, library for Blender. It does cost money, um, but if, if you have the cash, um, this has really sped up my workflow quite a bit as well. And I feel like not a lot of people have heard about it somehow. Now I have a couple of favorite HDRIs that I like to use. Um, this cave wall is one that's really, really awesome. Uh, in the indoor section here, this, this courtyard and this veranda are really cool too. Um, and some of the reasons I like these is, for example, if you look at the courtyard thing here, you've got this really blue sky and this really sort of warm uh, orange yellowish light and I'm just going to load it in very quickly so it downloads the HDRI there we go and then once I go over here into my environment 
Let's put an environment texture and it's already added it into the Blender file. So as you can see, you've got this really natural sort of looking sort of cooler lighting on one side and warmer lighting on the other. If we go into the ray visibility over here, we can turn off the camera thing and then we just get the, the image or the, the lighting and the reflections themselves. Um, now, generally when you load them in first, if you go look at the environment texture here, they're very small. So I'll grab like the 4K one, replace it very quickly. Um, I guess this is kind of a plug for the Blender Cloud. And you know, I don't, yeah, obviously if, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to, There's, you know, but um, I've noticed that it allows me to work really quickly. Yeah, you can use these HDRs for commercial purposes. All of them are uh, licensed under the public domain, so you're even free to share them. It's awesome. So that's how I'm able to put a lot of stuff on the Blender Cloud for free as well um, and include all the HDRs because they've licensed in the public domain. It's crazy. Like, it's really cool. All right, so we move my camera around a little bit just to see if we can get something a little bit cooler. And when you're moving this around, like if you're just trying stuff, you can always just hit escape to go back to what you had. I like it. I might try something a little bit more later. Um, but for now, we've got lighting um, and we've got something to mess around with and we can start doing shading and such. So, let's see. Let's see this lighting. This almost looks like some kind of bone structure you'd find all dried out in a desert somewhere. So if we go down to performance, crank up the start resolution a little bit. What graphics cards do I have? I get this question a lot. Um, I have three Titan X's. One of them is the, the newer one from, I think this year or last year. And the other ones are the older Titan X's. Um, I actually bought all three of them secondhand, so I managed to get them at a pretty discounted uh, price. It was still a lot of money, don't get me wrong, um, but uh, obviously I, I do professional work with this stuff and I like to be able to work quickly. So um, once I had enough money, I, I bought them and I've been really happy with them since. Um, they get a little noisy because I haven't water cooled them or anything, but they work just fine, so it's pretty Wow, that's incredible. So, this might sound weird, but like when you're, how should I explain this? For me, when I'm working with stuff, uh, I want to be able to work as quickly as possible. So it was kind of a no brainer moving over to, to like more high end stuff. Um, but as you can see, like I can work so quick now. So let's see if we just throw on a shader here very quickly. There's already one on here. Um, let's switch to the principled shader. So I'm using Blender 2.79, um, the test builds right now. But uh, I really like this principled shader. It gives you some awesome, awesome uh, reflections and things. Bring on the roughness. We bring on the color a little bit. And as you can see, like these look really cool. Um, but I was just saying, like, uh, with the cards, it's totally worth investing in it. Um, I, uh, I made the conscious decision to do that. And actually the first two that I bought is when I started moving over from 3ds Max to Blender. Uh, I was paying a lot of money for a 3ds Max license. It was, it's like 150 or 200 euros a month. It's pretty crazy to, to rent it. And I basically said to myself, okay, I'm gonna try use Blender for at least a year. And with all the money that I save up in that year, uh, like the, the 200 bucks or whatever that I'd pay a year for all the all the commercial software I was using. I put it aside, I uh, used Blender for a year, and then at the end of that year, I decided, okay, I'm gonna go full on Blender and actually buy the two cards, the two first cards. Um, and it was crazy because I went to go look online on a secondhand website and literally, like, as I decided it, two hours before somebody had posted two of them at like less than half price, I think, um, because he was like a, a computer modder and he'd used them in some custom builds and he, he didn't have any use for them anymore. So I got super lucky as well. Um, so that's sort of the story of how that got started and then I added one uh, in a little bit later. So. All right. Did I do stuff for NASA's Cassini mission? <laughs> Not as far as I'm aware. <laughs> no, I didn't, so. 
So the thing I like the most about the principled shader is that you can iterate very, very quickly. What do I mean by that? Um, rather than having to mix shaders and swap them out constantly, you've got all the different tools here. So I can switch between a metal shader and, um, and a glass shader very quickly. Uh, I can mess with the roughness. I can do all this stuff like in one, one part. And I still love building my own custom shader and doing weird things with them. Um, but this is just super fast and you can iterate again very, very quickly and, and try stuff out. So let's see, what do I want this to be? I definitely wanna see what happens if I put in, where are we? Pointiness uh, and put geometry. Put the point in this in here. This always takes a little while. So this is important when you're using the point in this shader. Um, you have to make sure that you're looking at your final result um, because it does change depending on your topology. So if I'm going to render this with two subdivisions, and then I'll check my subsurfs here. Everything's on. You want to make sure it's at the same level that you're going to render at. So I'm going to save very quickly first and see what happens if I bump it up to two. If the result is any better and actually worth it. <laughs> we moved from sliders to nodes and our main nodes is just one big slider. Yeah, it's true. It's kind of interesting. So did that really do anything? Let's go back. And it is getting pretty slow now, but it's just because I'm layering on the subdivisions. There we go. Just smooths it out a little bit more. And it's taken a while to start rendering, so that kind of sucks. Okay, let's have a look. So with this pointiness, you can get some really uh, cool masks going. And I use it quite a lot to add a little bit into the shader. You can see it accents the shape really nicely, so. You can flip it. I like that. So let's have a look here. Let's try and mix some shaders. So I use this point in as generally as a mask rather than anything else to mix two different shaders. And let's see what happens if we mix in a metallic shader here, maybe make it sort of gold. And now we can tweak this. So you can already see see it happening. You can see all this detail suddenly is being um, sort of added in, and it looks really cool. So um, thank you, a leader. I'm glad uh, you like the channel. I uh, I try to do something a little bit different than a lot of people. Like I really try to see if there's things that I can. Yeah, I don't know that I can touch on that maybe other people don't do. Um, so I'm I'm glad you like it. Um, why don't I use adaptive subdivision? <laughs> I use it sometimes. Um, maybe later if I want a little bit more, I can add it in. But as you can see, because we've got a fairly complex mesh already, uh, we can get some some interesting results. So what do we have here? What happens if I bring down the roughness? Gets a little bit more shiny. I like it a little, a little more rough here. Mess with this first shader. And see, this is what I mean by that the iterating, like you can just try stuff. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Look at the way this contrasts. And like, if I can give you one, if I can give one tip when you're trying to make this kind of thing, just when you're looking at it, just try and get excited by it. Like you saw that I just went, oh, that looks awesome. Like that's what you're really looking for um, in the first place. That's what you want to do as an artist and, and sort of push forth and make sure that people people will have that same reaction. If you're working on it and you're like, oh, that's really cool, you know, chances are a lot of other people are gonna say the same thing. So let me just grab a drink here. So let's see, this is cool, but I think it can be cooler. I like the shininess and the craziness of it. As if we set it to metallic. Ah. It's all right, maybe a little bit. 
What happens if we add another layer of reflection on top of it? And really boost the reflections. All right, so now it's time to go back to our camera. Put in a distance here and start playing with the depth of field. So I really like exaggerating this stuff. Um, it has been overused, but now you can start messing with the distance. And because you can see all this stuff happening in real time, I just really like it, you know. It's because I'm, I'm used to taking pictures, um, it's really nice to be able to work in near real time in 3D as well. well let's see. That's cool. I think we'll throw in a light here. See if that helps. I always want to try and lead lead your viewer's eye to uh, to where you want them to look at. So this is definitely my focal point, um, and then later I'll be looking at moving it to my like lower um, to the thirds for like the golden ratio and stuff. Because right now what's happening is sort of you're looking at it like this, and you get this golden spiral and that kind of stuff. I mean, for this one it works. For the other ones, uh, the examples I'll show later, they're just like framed in the middle, like a little picture or something like this, it's really abstract. You want people to sort of look at it and go, you want to lead their eye in, you know? It's like taking them by the hand and making sure that they go, there you go. What do I think about Eevee coming to Blender? I've played around with it a little bit. Um, it's super cool. I think it's uh, it's definitely gonna put Blender on the map as a, the versatile tool that it is. Um, for me, I've become I've gotten so fast with doing it this way now um, that I still prefer cycles at the moment. But I've definitely like like I said, I fooled around with that and it's cool. It does a lot of stuff really well. But I work with light and reflections a lot, and that's like the one thing that it's not very good at. Well, it's I mean it's okay at it. Don't get me wrong, it looks fine. But it's a real time engine, so it's not always correct, and it doesn't always behave the way I expect it to. But again, that's just down to getting used to it, I guess. So. Ooh, this is becoming a big colorful mess. I kind of like it. Let's see if we overdo it. Might be a bit much. Bring it back down. So when you're doing this stuff, just overdo it. Like, see what happens if you really go too far. I like that it just lights it up a little bit. But... We need something else, I don't know. I feel like it's still missing something. Let's look around at it, see if we can get a more interesting. Am I still in trackball mode? Yeah. Let's just have a look if we can see anything interesting here. inside part is definitely pretty cool looking. Just trying to find an interesting angle, but it's missing hair. <laughs> yeah, probably. Hair really slows it down on the GPU though. Let's see. If we just go for the, the tunnel effect. Maybe, I kind of like that. Let's see if we grab another camera here. And you just keep adding in cameras and then when you want to switch to it, you can switch to that one. There we go. Let's bring up the focal length. I like presenting a lot of stuff like this, sort of like a, an artwork or this weird molecule or something that you're just seeing in space, maybe. And then we can switch between the three different views to see what we like best. Or I like best, rather. <laughs> Come on. 
corrupted Pac-Man. <laughs> yeah. I guess it does. Let's see if we can tweak this. I kind of liked it like that. What happens if we mess around with it here? This is actually vastly different from the other examples that I, I did before, so it's nice that I'm trying something really weird and crazy here. How did I generate that shape? If you're just joining us now, a whole bunch of modifiers. So um, if you're interested in seeing how, the stream will be archived so you can actually look at it at a later date if you want to. I'll leave it up on YouTube and you'll see the full process. Uh, something, there's something about it that's just weird. Okay, let's see if we can't go back. Let's just save it. Let's see if we can't go back and maybe mess with the displace a little bit. That looks absolutely insane. That might be better. I think that fits the challenge a little bit better. Like you can still see that it might have been a sphere at one point. I don't know. Maybe I should just leave it the way it was because it was pretty cool. I'm not 100% sold on it. Let's save a new version. And that's that typical thing that you hear a lot of artists say, the, uh, the whole kill your darlings thing. So I've got a saved version. I can always go back if I want to. Now I can just let my um, uh, let my crea creativity go a little bit and not worry about losing the work that I've done already. Uh, I'm gonna go back in and mess with the display texture a little bit more. It really is a never-ending process. <laughs> and the weirdest stuff now. The cell noise is what's uh, let's iterate through it. Okay, this is our mask, so let's see what happens if we change the mask up. Yeah, the challenge was to just like um, see what you can do with a simple object, but you know, it's always cool that you can sort of see where it's coming from as well. Let's see. So now we're just manipulating the base shape and the, the mask. Ooh, this is getting real slow. Go back to the distorted noise. It is my favorite, I can't help it. That's interesting, it almost looks like a weird spaceship or something. I don't know if it happens if we really up the distortion.
that remesh still helping us? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. See, the problem with the remesh is that it closes the holes. Um, so it might even be more interesting to pull this mask down. Like it's not very good at uh, understanding there's openings. Ooh. Oh, of course, because the vertex weight gets completely destroyed. So a lot of these modifiers that generate geometry, oh, you have to, um, there we go. Now we're getting something. You have to make sure that your the order of operations is correct. So that's pretty rad. I don't know, I'm gonna save this one, but I think uh, I prefer what we had before and just go with that. At least we gave it a shot. Something about the shape that's making it really hard to frame though. if we add volume to this. Now that's where it gets real slow. Nope, it's not worth it. Uh, remove. Where's our other camera? We had something cool, maybe we should just stick with it. Or at least we gave it a shot, you know. Where am I going? What's that? If Grant is doing more, going to make more of these challenges, will I participate in them too? Maybe, I don't know. Um, sort of depends on how much time I have. Uh, I had a fairly... I ended up having a lot less time than I thought today because my server crashed and I had spent all day rebuilding uh, a bunch of drives. But um, maybe in the future, I mean, if I can, it's always nice to, to try stuff out. All right, let's just finish this one off and then I'll, uh, I'll show you the other ones I did and we can talk a little bit about those as well. So let's render this bad boy. This will take a while. make sure my camera isn't locked to the view anymore so I can't do anything stupid. And let's go to the node editor. There we go, so we can start compositing. This will take a few minutes. Let me grab a drink. If you have any questions, now is the time. Do I do commissions and where do I earn my living? So um, I'll give you some, some backstory of where, where I started. Uh, so when I graduated from college, I started in a studio doing environment and um, visual effects work. So uh, I worked on an, short, an animated short back in the day. Um, that I think unfortunately never got released. Um, then I moved on to do motion graphics in another studio and from there I basically started um, doing a lot of freelance work and then I finally moved over to freelancing. So yeah, I do this as a job. Um, I mainly do, nowadays, I mainly do a lot of work for musicians like album covers, VJ loops, uh, I do a lot of, I do some commercial stuff as well. Um, yeah, I've done stuff for I guess web commercials and things like animated movies for products. Um, but my heart is definitely in all this really weird stuff. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's been cool. Cause like when you first start out, generally, um, you get hired for like your skills. 
and uh, people just look at your resume and they're like, okay, you're a 3D artist, you know, you, they check all the boxes, like, oh, you know this application, that plugin, okay, you can work here, that's fine. Um, and then after a while, I started feeling like it, I wasn't really getting out of it what I wanted um, in the studio. Uh, so I felt that I really needed to do my own thing and that's where that sort of came from. And um, yeah, that's it. So now I do, I just do all this freelance stuff. So thanks for popping in. Um, so do I like garlic bread? Yes, actually I do. I like it very much. A um, little bit of cheese on it as well. It's awesome. So now this is rendered. Let's see what we can do with this in compositing. Oh, I hit render. Why? Give it a sec. Come on. There we go. So I'll go to the UV image editor and now we can start compositing. And this is the thing that I just absolutely love about Blender. Like I've never, I didn't have to leave it. I don't have to save it out, go to a different program. I can just do it all here. Um, and Blender's compositor, I mean, it's okay. It, it's a little on the slow side, but for some basic stuff, you can do anything you really need to do with it. So that's nice. So let's see. Always start with the glare because no motion graphics go without glow, obviously. Let's add in a little bit of glow, maybe mix it down. All right, so this is okay. I'm not 100% convinced. It's all right, I guess. Maybe bring the threshold up a little bit. And mix down. Let's seven, five. There we go. We want it to just sort of accentuate the highlights and not overpower it too much, even though it's still brightening my entire image. Okay, let's see. So I think we're going to do some fairly, fairly basic color correction here. Glare. Mm, I'm actually not feeling it. Let's see what happens if we use streaks. Maybe we can do something fun with that. Have I ever tried out Blender's built-in filters? Um, which ones do you mean? The ones over here with the uh, the looks? Because I used to use the Film one quite a lot, but since Filmic has come out and is actually integrated in Blender, I use this high contrast one and that's about it. Um, if you're talking about this other stuff here, I do use it quite a bit. I use a bunch of different ones, so. Um, I don't know, I don't really know where to go with this one. So. Generally, something else that I do is, uh, right now, this is just like a black background and a thing pasted on it. And you want this to feel more sort of in an environment somewhere. Now, obviously we can't add extra geometry in, so we just want to keep this, uh, we want to do some compositing. So I tend to fake lighting a little bit. Um, oh, the compositor node filter. Yeah, actually I use it a lot, to be honest. Um, you can do cool stuff by, for example, sharpening it up first. And it's pretty noisy image because I rendered it a low, a fairly low sample count. But just by sharpening it up here, uh, if we look at it and I turn it off, I don't know how visible it will be in the stream, but you can bring out a lot of small details, but you have to make sure that your render isn't too noisy. Um, and then usually towards the end of the compositing pipeline, I will add a soften filter. And that might seem really counterintuitive, but um, especially when you're doing animations, uh, the cool thing about it is if you look at camera footage, um, it doesn't matter, you know, like for most cameras, unless you're going like up to 8K cinema cameras and that kind of thing, but most cameras um, aren't 100% razor sharp the same way CG is. So if you want stuff to feel and look a little bit more natural, then you can actually use that soften filter to soften it up just a little bit towards the end. And it's 
Yeah, it's all these little, little details that fool your brain into thinking that you're looking at something real rather than something rendered. But let's see what we can do with a little bit more uh, color correction here. So I use curves a lot. Um, generally, I'll try and put in some contrast first, see if that ha if that works. If it doesn't really do anything, see if what happens if I take it out and just bo boost the mids a little bit. So that's interesting, like that. And then play with the individual channels, like take away the red. Um, and as you can see, because if I take this out now, because this image is predominantly red, by actually taking it away, you get more of a color variance because all of the blues and the, and the greens are going to come out as well, which is really nice. So maybe we can even boost the greens, see what happens. Yeah. I like that it's sort of crazy and colorful. I'm still not sold on the streaks though. Let's see if we miss... This color modulation thing is awesome because it like breaks them up. See, they become all glitchy and stuff. I like that. Bring on the threshold again. Where are we? Yeah, it's looking all right. Um, weird trick as well if you want things to, especially if you're doing like visualizations or something that needs to look realistic then uh, adding blue in the compositor tends to help sell it a little bit, especially with outdoor scenes, because it sort of fakes the atmosphere in the air. But uh, I don't know, just turn it on and off. Just hit the M key to mute the node. As you can see, it's a lot more diverse now. Maybe we went a little bit too far with the green and the blue, but. There we go. Okay, so onto the thing I was talking about earlier, um, faking the light. So this is something really fun, um, where are we? So an ellipse mask generally gets used for, uh, like using as a mask, I guess, <laughs> what's, in the, what's in the name, you know? Um, but I use it to create uh, sort of graduated blurs and, and things. So let's say I put this one up at the top. So X, uh, X zero is over on this side. So X is zero to one and Y is zero to one over here. So one and one it puts it over here and zero and zero puts it over here. So something I'll do is put in a circle and then blur it out like crazy. Um, yeah, I usually switch between Gaussian and fast Gaussian. They're fairly similar. Um, sometimes one seems to be working better than the other. The reason I use this relative setting is because if I were to render this at a different resolution, um, because you're making your blur relative to the size of the canvas, um, it'll actually look exactly the same at higher resolution. So that's really awesome. So I'm gonna mix that in. So in compositing um, in CG, you want to avoid using stuff like screen and burn and dodge and all that kind of thing. You want to stick with the simple mathematical calculations. So add, multiply, uh, subscri subtract, subtract. Um, you've got to watch out with that one because if you get values that are under zero, so under black, which can happen, uh, you can get weird distortion uh, and like clipping and stuff. But what the two blending modes that I really use the most are add and multiply. Sometimes I'll use one of the other ones if I want to add in fake grain afterwards, but that really depends on the project. So. so what's going on? If I set this to add, you'll see exactly what I'm trying to do here. Um, this looks really awful, but knowing that we had our light here, uh, that we had light on one side, we had sort of a warm light on this side and a cooler light on this side. Now we can fake that by bringing it back in. So it is blue-ish, you know, something like that. And by bringing the factor down, yeah, maybe a little bit higher. You can see all of a sudden it just ha adds this little hint of things going on outside of the scene uh, without actually having to use volumetrics and that kind of thing. You could even make the, uh, the circle bigger so now it'll go from here to here. No, actually that wasn't the size. So we can height set it to two. There you go, and now you get a bigger, a lot bigger gradient, but it's just a case of tweaking it. There we go. And then usually I'll just copy it over, duplicate it. 
So if you're curious, um, I'm just gonna add this here. That's just what it looks like. So because we're adding it on and we're, uh, we're turning down the, the opacity here, um, yeah, you get this really nice sort of light looking effect. This is a, a trick, I was really happy when I figured that one out because you see, see all these really cool motion graphic things and they always look really nice and interesting and I always wonder like how do they get it to look like it's sort of floating in midair but there's still lights and atmosphere going and um, this is basically it. Like it's a very cheap trick but it works really well. And now if we change this color um, to something a little bit more orange to sort of accentuate the light that's coming from this side, um, then we get this really interesting result. Now I'm going to turn these both down a little bit. And I always like having one be a little bit stronger than the other so we have uh, a sense of sort of a, a, a main light and a secondary light. There we go. That's all right. And now we can go for full cheesiness of it. I really overdo this one sometimes, but I like it. The lens distortion note is awesome. First, I like to really, really crank it and see what happens. So you get this really weird effect uh, and it breaks it up. Um, this effect is called chromatic aberration and it appears in camera lenses as well. If you're doing it this way and compositing, it's not 100% like physically accurate and all that, but I like it. It's interesting. Maybe let's bring that down just a little bit so it's just the edges. And then what I tend to do as well is you have this little switch node and uh, what I'll do is I'll pipe in the original over here. So now you can turn that switch on and off and you can switch between your composited version and your original version and you can actually see like, is it really making it better or is it just making it worse? Now I want a little bit more contrast in this because it's sort of getting a bit, I don't know. I'll turn that back off and maybe add the contrast in here. looking all right. It's not the best thing I've ever done, but it's okay. I feel like there's something missing. I don't know what. I'm bringing width and the height down here of these two. So they're not quite as overpowering. Maybe just the one. There we go. Has a bit better feel now. It's a little bit clearer. What happens if I just turn off the curves? So it's just all playing around and trying things. Yeah, it's all right. I'm gonna leave it at this uh, for this one. So you can already see what the other ones are gonna be. Um, well, thanks for watching. I'm glad uh, I'm glad you stuck around. And this, like I said, the stream will be available so you can catch the rest of it later once you have some time. So save this one and uh, actually open some of the other ones. So. Uh, show you them first. Projects, projects, projects. Sorry, simplicity output. So the first one I did was a pretty cool one, and I rendered these fairly large. I have no idea why it doesn't want to open them. Typical. What the hell? That like never happens. Let's open it with GIMP then instead. So this is the first one I did. I'll open up the uh, the file in just a sec. So this kind of stuff. Um, when I was first doing these dots, uh, I was doing this with uh, with particles, and um, yeah. Then I was talking to. Grant, I think, and he was like, yeah, you can't really do particles because I had a second object that was like this little sphere. So I started looking around and started thinking like, how am I gonna pull this off? Like I want these particles to sort of be inside it and then um, and then make it look like that. So I ended up creating a shader, which is just transparent with dots and I'll show you that one in a second. So let's actually open up the file here. Let's go to number one. Uh, this is the last one, I believe.
All right, so let's walk you through very quickly. So that shader I ended up creating was this one. Yep, so I created, ended up creating dots, which is really cool. Um, yeah, basically what it is, it's a bunch of wave textures mixed together, multiplied together, and because you're multiplying them in three directions, they eventually make a dot because they're these like gradient lines. Hello, Austin, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, so again, the proof is in the pudding. So this one has probably the most modifiers out of all of them. And uh, I don't know who mentioned it before about the adaptive subdivision. I actually use it on this one um, to get a little bit more from it. So let's start deconstructing it. So that's just a subdivision. Then I have this wireframe, which I can turn off. So you see the way it's this sort of crossed pattern. That's the thing I was talking about before with the decimate modifier. So if I turn this back, this one off, um, if you set this decimate to unsubdivide, then you get this cross pattern. So that's how I created it um, like that. Then I turn off the wireframe. Uh, again, I use the vertex weight edit the same way I did with the textures before um, to sort of only have the wireframe appearing in certain places. And then this last solidify here actually solidifies the mesh. So this is what it looks like without a third solidify. So that's what I did in the beginning of the one that I made earlier, um, using the solidify to sort of get all these inner layers. And the cool thing about it is, um, if we just look at these, you actually have the materials offset so if I just render this now, you can see the inside actually has a different material than the outside. And one of those materials is that dotted, dotted grid material that's sort of lighting everything up. So if you look at the materials, you can see I have a whole bunch of different ones and they have all the different layers of different materials. Um, actually, I'll make sure that I'll make these files available for everybody as well uh, once I've posted the, the challenges and then you can have a look at them at your own pace as well, completely deconstruct them and, and use them for whatever you want. Um, you know, it's been fun trying this out. I've learned a lot as well. Uh, I know I, a lot of people tell me like that I might make it look a little bit easy, but you know, I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly trying to find new tricks. So that's the most important part. Then, um, oh yeah, this is a cool one as well. So if you use an edge split modifier, uh, so now if I turn on the smooth, nothing really happens uh, it just smooths out this mesh and actually I'm gonna show you this mesh a little bit more clearly but if you turn on the edge split and you set it to zero what it does it, it sort of errors out on um, uh, on flat sort of surfaces because this is just a flat surface because it's a cube and because it's subdivided as you can see maybe I'll just turn on the wire so you can see what's going on it's a little bit clearer um, when you turn on the edge split, usually what it does, it looks at the angles between the polygons and then splits them at certain angles. Like you'll use it to make, um, if you're modeling sci-fi stuff and you have this hard line and maybe like a mask or, or a mech or something like that, you'll use it to split your edges so you get these nice hard edges. But I found that if you use it on flat planes, it sort of freaks out and it starts um, splitting all these random, random um, edges. So then you get this really complex looking effect where you've got these flat planes and then the um, some other polygons that sort of do this weird thing. And the reason they're moving in is because it is smooth. So the smooth, you can just crank it up and then obviously you'll get even weirder things. But because I just did a little bit, then uh, yeah, you get these cool patterns. And there's one thing which is a little bit unfortunate is that you don't keep the straight edges. Um, I'd love for there to be like an option that says uh, any of the boundary edges that it tries to keep them straight or respects them. That'd be really cool, but you know, I'm not too worried about it. Well, let's deconstruct this a little bit further. Again, the trick uh, that I've been using a lot lately with the mask and the vertex weight. So this is a mask modifier and then the vertex weight has, um, you know, another texture in it. And then this texture is one I use quite a bit as well. So uh, again, distorted noise, if you've been following along, you're probably sick of me using it at this point. But if you put two cell noises together, you get this really sort of technical looking pattern, which is absolutely awesome. And it makes it really, really fun to use. Um, and I like this techie type of stuff. Um, for the people that don't know, like I'm a big fan of Beeple's work and he, he does a lot of very similar things. And, um, you know, at one point, like you have to wonder, am I copying somebody or not? But 
just look at look at your favorite artists like if you like what they're doing try to emulate it there's nothing wrong with learning and like if you make something that's like very obviously copied nobody says you have to post it but if you learn something from it that's kind of the whole point in the first place um but yeah so i'll turn off the mask vertex weight um then yeah so this is the first step so i'm just gonna close these for a second so i can see what i'm doing so the first thing i did and i'm gonna turn these off there you go it's a round cube so if anybody wants to dispute that there it is um so obviously subsurf it first and then i use the cast trick which we we're using earlier as well um which didn't you know didn't pan out um and then when using the planar decimation you can actually get a perfect cube from a sphere so that's a great way to circumvent the whole idea of the challenge um i feel like i was kind of cheating with this one um maybe i was trying a little bit too hard uh, but then solidifying it again, um, giving it all those extra layers. So we'll just turn on the layers for now and I'll try and show you each step of the way. Um, another solidify, so this gives it even more thickness. So I've solidified it three times at this point. And as you can see, the amount of layers here is just kind of crazy. Then the subsurf um, is just a simple subsurf. It's not a smoothing one. Oh, crap, I shouldn't apply that. This is going to hurt. I think I might just have to start a new Blender file. I'm not going to wait for this. Just open it up again. I'm going to turn off all the other modifiers so you can do it step by step. And I'll do the other ones a little bit quicker. I was just really happy with the way this one turned out. So where were we? All right, it was this subsurf. So that's what we were doing. So, um, oh yeah, you can use remesh for turning a sphere into a cube as well. That's true. Uh, I guess I kind of did it the hard way. <laughs> uh, so again, this subsurf, it's just a regular one. So rather than this Catmull Clark, which will turn it into a sphere again, I just use simple. And that's where all this uh, vertex weight edit and mask stuff comes in. You need a lot of... Um, as you can see, you need a lot of uh, geometry to get this texture to make it look right. And then edge splitting them, smoothing them out to get these little extra things sticking out. Um, decimating it again. So we're going from this regular mesh that we had before to this differently shaped mesh. So I can then, there we go, if we solidify it. So I can solidify it. Then the vertex weight edit adds in another layer of um, texture controlled vertex groups, which I then use with the wireframe. And sort of the reason I decimated that is so you get this different looking wireframe and you get a different looking pattern. Um, it just makes it look more interesting. Like if it's all gonna go the same direction, then it gets really confusing to see what's going on. And this sort of breaks it up a little bit. You can do some cool stuff. And then finally a subsurf with uh, adaptive subdivision for some of the, the shaders. Now I'm not going to go through the shaders because the, the challenge is more about the modeling, I think. Um, and again, like I said, I'll release the files and just follow me on like Twitter, Instagram or whatever and I'll, I'll make sure I post it. Um, so that's that one. Let's see, this one's still crashing, that's fine. Let's open some of the other ones. Modif modifier stack into thought planning. Yeah, so once you get more proficient with the modifiers, that's uh, that's the whole point. Like I can start thinking ahead. So usually when I'm putting my first modifiers on, I'm not thinking about what I want to do right now, but I'm thinking about sort of the final shape that I want to reach a couple of steps ahead. So a lot of it is just sort of preparing the mesh to make it like have the right topology for wireframe, or um, maybe because I'm going to smooth it out and do some other weird things with it. So so I'll look at the second one here first. I'm going to open it up in GIMP again because my picture viewer decided to crash. So this one's looking a little bit more organic. Um, I don't know, it was pretty late at night when I was making this one, I was kind of tired, but I still like how it turned out. Uh, and let's go look at the file real quick. Is it this one? Yeah. So let's go 3D view and just collapse this. 
Have I seen Gleb's entries, Pure Shader Magic? Yeah, it is. I saw it. He just uses the Voronoi texture to uh, to do the subdivision displacements. And the thing is, a lot of the displacing I do here, you could probably do with subdivision as well. But obviously, the reason I do it is so I can keep layering and, and use it as a base shape. But his entry was awesome too. I liked it. Sort of this gemstone looking thing. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend you to have a look at it. So this is what the 3D shape looks like of this one. And again, this is actually a fairly, fairly simple one. Um, so I had some subdivision surface on this one as well, so I'm just going to turn that off. And I'm just going to turn all the modifiers off and we'll start from the beginning. So again, for proof, this is just another, uh, another round cube. I'm not cheating. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is just subdivide it, subsurf it, because generally if you want to display stuff, you want to subsurf it quite a bit. And uh, actually, it's funny that you mentioned Gleb's entry because his use of the Voronoi might have actually inspired me to use um, use it as well. I think I made this the same day he posted his. So there you go. It it probably like subconsciously pushed me towards doing this. Um, then decimating it again, uh, I use this planar decimate. And when you have these really extreme shapes, as you can see, the the wires on these get really crazy. So. You could even go further, like if you collapse all these down, inset these, and then maybe push them out or push them in, um, you could get this really cool crystal looking thing and, and have a super, super complex thing going on. Then uh, smooth it out, because why not? Uh, I just wanted to smooth them out. And plus, if you look at these edges over here, actually, I'm gonna do it like this so it's a little bit clearer. If you look at the edges over on the sides here, they're very rigid. And by smoothing them out, you get these weird looking sort of organic things stretching over the edge. Um, and I really like that. Like there's still some regular topology in there. There's still some other stuff in there. And then the wireframe is where it's at. So this looks really weird and creepy. Um, I was also actually watching Alien Covenant, I think, um, at the time. Sometimes I'll, I'll like watch movies when I'm working. And I think I was looking at the... Um, the weird, oh, can't think of that name now. Come on. The face huggers, that's it. I think uh, the face huggers might have actually inspired this this shape. Um, and again, it's just a wireframe, but the cool thing about the wireframe is, you can, like I said, you can offset it. So this is what it looks like without, and because you offset it on this really crazy shape, um, you get this yeah, just really sick looking thing. and. If I would have shaded this differently, it would have definitely been very creepy. So looking at the subsurf now, I'm just going to turn on optimal display for a second. There you go. And that's what the, the end shape looks like. Um, now I did do one other thing for this one. I turned on the double sided. So if I turn it off, you can see um, this definitely errors out a little bit. And to fix that it is just double sided. Um, I always have these really interesting conversations with people that are like modelers and sculptors when I show them this stuff. They, uh, they, they just look at me like, but that, you know, it's bad topology. What are you doing? You can't do that. It's wrong. And I, I don't really care. You know, it's all about the shape and the final result. It doesn't really matter how you get there. So, um, Big Dino asks PC specs. I already touched on that a little bit. Um, I'm using three three beefy NVIDIA GPUs, and actually my um, CPU is an eight core Intel CPU, and I've got 64 gigs of RAM and way too many SSDs that I've sort of garnered over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, it's I, I talk about it earlier in the video. So once the archive is up, you can definitely watch the whole thing and then. Wait, what are you saying? After sending four entries and watching the stream, I realized that my problem with modifiers is that I tend to, that I tried keeping it really clean, whilst I should go for the opposite. The more you know, yeah, that's it. Like, that's something I see a lot when people use modifiers. They, you know, they use them to control, to control. But I use it to sort of expand stuff and really mess up the mesh, and then go from there uh, and see what we can create from that messed up mesh. Um, as a kid, I was always fascinated with stuff uh, that wasn't quite right. Like I remember when we were home, when at home, we would get faxes that were all messed up. And my parents had this friend who was a graphic designer, like back in the '90s, and he would take all these messed up faxes with these really weird lines, and he'd scan them in and do really cool graphic design stuff with it. And I've always been fascinated with, like, um, I guess, 
digital distortion and things that go wrong in the digital space. Uh, I, I like the way things like that work. So, um, but that's it for this one. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, again, there's some adaptive subsurf going on here and I'll show you exactly for what. If you look at the, the shapes here, if I just zoom in a little bit. Now, if you look at the shape here, it has a Voronoi texture on it just to give it that little bit of extra, I don't know, organic sort of feeling look. Um, so let's open the third one. A quick look at the question. So I, when I was testing the stream, I made this one very quickly, actually. So somebody asked, how many hours did I spend fixing Linux problems with graphics cards, especially? Um, not that many, actually. Uh, I've always been fairly lucky with that, I think. Uh, the When I first started getting into it, uh, like trying to use Linux full time, I was using Manjaro Linux, which is like Arch Linux. And if you're not that advanced at Linux, it's it can break stuff very easily. And then with that one, I did spend a lot of time like trying to fix things and I kind of got sick of that. So I, I went looking for some other distributions that um, were just easier to use. And if you're using anything Ubuntu based, they have a driver manager that allows you to literally just click I have NVIDIA cards, download the driver and it installs the latest uh, the latest like certified driver and it's seamless. It works beautifully. Um, other Linux problems. Yeah, I mean, it's like with any system. I mean, I started off on the Mac uh, way when I was a kid. That's what we had at home. Then when I, by the time I finished college, I had built my own PC because I was using 3ds Max and it wasn't on the Mac. So I switched to PC. And then a couple of years ago, I got sick of the way Autodesk do stuff and, and started moving into Blender. And then I just switched over to Linux because uh, for me, like the big push into Linux was Windows 10. I, I just... I didn't like it. Uh, it did too much stuff in the background, like all the updating. I couldn't turn things off that I didn't want to turn off. And I felt like I was losing control over my own computer and that pushed me into Linux. So from there on, I tried stuff. Um, but for the most part, like if you're just starting out, just use something. I, I used Linux Mint for quite a while and now I'm on X, like X Ubuntu or Zubuntu, or how you say it. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it exactly. Um, I liked Linux Mint because Cinnamon was really good because uh, it was very very much like Windows and a lot of the keys are very similar to Windows. So that's really awesome if you want to switch. But then, um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, I was having problems with it um, crashing, like the desktop environment crashing if I was rendering and doing something on the browser and having another browser open and having a little movie open, it got overwhelmed and then the desktop environment would crash and I would lose all my work, so that sucked. Um, but uh, now with Ubuntu, XFCE is really nice. It works really well. You know, I've themed it like a crazy person. I really like dark gray stuff in case people haven't noticed. Um, so that's something I really like about Linux, actually. You can theme the crap out of it and it looks really awesome. Um, it's not that you can't do it on Windows, but it has better support for it on Linux, I feel. Um, so this is the third one, and this is a very quick one, which I created very quickly. Uh, so this is the last one. Let's see. Close these off. Is this one still crashing? That'd be hilarious. Yep, it's still crashing. So that's our first one. So let's close this one as well. And one more blender. And number three. And again, this is fairly simple. I created this one in, I think, an hour. I was testing out the stream uh, to see if it was working, and I was just kind of trying to get my workflow going. and. Yeah, it took me about an hour to create this one, so that was nice. Um, and it's a little bit more complex, but we'll start from the beginning again. And then we've seen all of them. So again, proof is in the pudding. There you go. It is indeed a sphere. Um, so again, solidify. You might have noticed that I use this trick a lot to create all the different layers. Oh, hi, AD. I haven't seen it. Thanks for joining. <laughs> um, so again, subsurf it and then use the vertex weight edit and the mask. So we get now this really weird mesh. And I'm sure you're, you're like for the people that have been here since the start, you're starting to see some patterns in how I do stuff. Um, and usually when I find some of these tricks, uh, either I'll make a tutorial about it or I'll, if I have the time um, and I'll use it like until I'm sick of it. And then that forces me to try new stuff uh, because I get sort of sick of it. But the cool thing is if you have these smooth, um, these broken polygons, if you smooth them like crazy, these really nice organic looking things. 
Again, this uh, set split normals, it's called uh, the normal edit over here. Just by turning it on, you can flip those normals all in the right direction. It sort of fixes them for you. Another solidify, uh, and then a little bit of a displace at the end to push it out, and that's it. And again, a subsurf to smooth it all out. So this one is fairly simple as well. And with the solidifies, again, I offset the materials to get the, the different results. So let's see if I can, uh, did I seriously just close the other one? I have to render it again. It's okay. Well, I have to render it later. So actually I'm going to set it up so I can render it. 2K, lots of samples. Um, and that is all I need, I think. So I can render this one later and then I'll post it later. So that's it. The one you saw the one that I did. Actually, I'll go back to the blend file. Too many blender files. So that's the one we created now. And how long have we been streaming? About two hours. So again, this one took an, an hour and a half, something like that. If it'll start rendering, we'll just wait for it. So we have this one and then the final result. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll post that later. I'm not gonna worry about it right now. That one and then the three other ones. So this one, oh. that one and that one and that's it. So um, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed the stream. This is really nice sort of experience for me the first time as well. Um, let me know like Hit me up on Twitter or Instagram or whatever if you enjoy this stuff and you and, and you like the way I stream. Like I said, this was the first time for me, so I'd be happy to do more of these because um, I'm working like usually at night. I'm, I'm trying stuff out anyway, and uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, to show you more stuff. So um, thanks everybody for joining, and uh, that's it for me today. Uh, the stream will be up archived on YouTube, and once I've posted all of the the little things, all the little images. I'll uh, post all the uh, the blend files and everything on um, the Blender Cloud for free as public domain. So you guys can grab all of them and try out. And if you want to do stuff with them and render your own version, you can do it. I don't care. It's all good. Uh, this was a lot of fun trying this challenge. So, all right. See you later, guys. Thanks again for joining.